Wearable technology, big data, the sheer overload of devices that surround us all the time. How does all of this impact our lives? To help answer these questions, chip giant Intel has a cultural anthropologist on staff, Dr. Genevieve Bell, who I'm very happy to welcome to the program. Dr. Bell. Hi. You told me I can't call you Dr. Bell. You can call me Genevieve. Okay, okay. Uh, we had some good video there of Google Glass and what it looks like maybe to jump out of the sky wearing it. Um, <laughs> but you, now you study wearable technology and Google Glass is coming, uh, perhaps an Apple iWatch. How, how will wearable technology change, our, change everyday life? Change everything. Well, I mean, I think the most important thing for me is to remember wearable technology isn't new. I mean, you know, look back a thousand years, we have worn technology, whether it was swords and shields, where I come from, boomerangs and woomeras, moving sort of forward into the glasses you and I both wear are a form of technology. But you work for, you, you work for Intel, chips. What oh, makes these different is they have What makes them different is power. they're connected, right? Connected. And I think they're connected and they're starting to have data, as you say, that tells us things about it. Now, you know, Google Glass is the first, I have to imagine, what will be a steady drumbeat of technologies. I mean, it's already building on things like Fitbit and Nike Fuel. So we've already the had... The little bands, we should tell yeah, people, so little, little small, bands that maybe track small how many steps computing. you take during exactly. the day. Exactly. So I think that notion of how this progresses, for me, the important part is to remember, A, it's not new. We've, we've worn things on our bodies. What becomes new is that these are telling us other things or connecting us to larger data sources. And I think, you know, what becomes fascinating is how does this start to progress moving forward? You know, we know as soon as people wore things on their bodies, we had to change architecture of <laughs> physical houses. We changed the way we talked about what people were doing. And answer, all of those things happen. Answer your own question. How, how, how does it change, given that the wearable technology we're talking about now is far more sophisticated oh, God, than yes. anything we've worn in the past? Oh, absolutely. So, I mean, I think there's a couple of things that become immediately clear. One is that we're going to see... I think a shift in manners and etiquette. So we know that new technologies always drive a kind of sense of, if it's connected, when do I turn it off? When do I turn it on? Where do I wear it and where don't I? What are the kind of go and no go zones socially mm -hmm. as well as technically? We had a great, great story on our website uh, this weekend about just the etiquette in the age of Google Glass. Well, I mean, I think we've already gone through 10 years of trying to work out what the etiquette was with smartphones, right? You know, I've spent enough time in people's homes to know that there are arguments about do you bring them into bed? <laughs> do you take them on vacation? Do you tweet from weddings and funerals? I mean, all of those things are conversations that actually human beings are having right in this minute now. And, and so. I and, and you, it's interesting because you, you read, I, I read last week that somebody had come up with an app. So there are some versions of glass in, in, in the public. Somebody had come up with an app so that you could take a photo by blinking. So you wouldn't actually, but you, you could have Google Glass taken on right now. You've, of, you've of, yeah. already taken several photos of me. That's it's a little creepy. I don't know if you'd want 15 to 20 photos taken per minute. Or of album, you. Of, well, of anyone. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> but, but, I mean, that, that presents some, some pretty scary issues. Oh, absolutely. So I would say, you know, first comes the questions about what's appropriate and rapidly following comes all the anxieties. You know, what does it mean to imagine that your glasses are now effectively Superman's glasses? I mean, they're telling you all these things that don't appear on the surface to be clear. And we know that new technologies are always accompanied by fears and anxiety, some of them rational, some of them deeply irrational. And mm -hmm. I suspect this stuff, as is true with all devices that are being connected to the internet and are gathering data, raise really interesting questions about notions of privacy, notions of regulation, and notions arguably also of reputation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's one thing to be smart, it's another thing if your smartness is being completely augmented. And chances are we will find new ways of imagining what makes a smart, interesting human being, right? Maybe, do I have to take your glasses off to see what you're really mm -hmm. like? And I, I wonder about, so the folks at Google, they talk about the Star Trek computer. This provides them inspiration that in the future, they hope you will be able to speak to a computer conversationally and it will be able to give you back answers to more questions than you could possibly imagine. And I wonder, I guess asking someone from Intel, is that even possible? Is the computing power could, could that ever be achieved? Natural language processing? I mean, it's certainly... Well, to such a degree that it would be that sophisticated that what we see on Star Trek is actually possible. <laughs> we need to talk about all the science fiction movies that might be actually possible and go down that path. I mean, I think, you know, we will get to a point where certain kinds of real-time processing are absolutely possible, both because of what we know in terms of algorithms, in terms of what we know about data sets. There are always going to be challenges, though, right, about, you know, how do you formulate the right question 
you know, how do you formulate a question that gets you the answers you want? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, think about all the challenges we've had with every comp computer that's been trying to pass the Turing test for a million, you know, well, not a million years, at least 50 Passed years. the Turing test. The Turing test. The Tell test us, of, to explain what, what that is to uh, our Alan Turing, very famous computer scientist, sets out an article in 1950 where he asks what is arguably the most interesting question in computer science in 100 years, which was, can a machine think? And the test for him of machines thinking would be a machine and a human being both behind a wall, another human being over here, asking the machine and the human being a series of questions. Mm -hmm. And the point at which the human being doing the asking can't distinguish between the computer and the person, the Turing test is passed. To this day, no one has been able to make a computer. But we're getting there. We're getting closer.